from the island of enchantment, Puerto Rico. And to all Spanish-speaking persons around the world, and this time in English, this is Corriendo Sobre 50 <laughs> Podcast. This is your friend Ramon Manzano from Las Piedras, Puerto Rico. And on the other side of the ocean, Mr. Jose Otero, the master sergeant of running. What's going on? Man, sorry, sorry to be in the podcast right now from my car because I was doing something that is supposed to take only a couple of hours and here it's six o'clock and I'm driving home around. So sorry for that, but hey, we are here. We are here and uh, we have a great show today, a great uh, story to, to tell. And not even to tell, just to listen to the person, how he overcome so many stuff and in his life. Uh, and thanks to Ronin is one of the reasons he's here talking to us today. And uh, he's going to share that with people so he can inspire others and uh, to do the same, uh, to never give up and continue to live. That's that's the main model of this and uh, the main uh, message that we're going to send. And, uh, hey, uh, Manzano, this is uh, a good story and uh, a real far away, too. Uh, so uh, let's start. Let's start from there. Yep. Um, let, let's first clarify why. Why are we doing this episode in, in, in English? Uh, about we have about 66 episodes already, and this is only the second episode in English. And it's because our guest is uh, is far, far away. Uh, our guest from today is right now in Australia, but he's Scottish, and he have a very interesting history of of uh, survival and motivation to all runners around the world. So we want to welcome to our podcast, Mr. Bob Carey Grieve. Uh, welcome, Bob, to Corriendo Sobre 50 podcast. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the chance to come and talk to you. We are very, very, very happy to have you. Uh, you're, you are the farthest guest that we have already <laughs> <laughs> in the podcast. So for, for our oceans only. <laughs> for me, yeah. it's incredible. We are we are recording as uh, almost six thirty Saturday here in Puerto Rico and in Washington. You are on Sunday, almost eight thirty on your side. So yep. Yeah, it's, it's early Sunday morning. We're in the future. The future looks fantastic, I can tell you. <laughs> Nothing has happened. <laughs> Everybody's okay. Yeah, yeah, it's lovely. It's a sunny day. It's going to be great. Weather will be wonderful for you tomorrow. <laughs> thank you. Thank, you, oh, for nice, the, thank nice. you for the weather advice. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jose, Jose, I, I, I met uh, Bob through Jose. Jose has been in contact with Bob to for this interview. So I would like to, Jose to to talk about uh, about you and, 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 and then we can start yeah. your com our conversation about uh, yeah. your history. Well, I, I read uh, Bob's story about how he overcome so many different health problems that uh, and how the running helped him to come back and and overcome all that. I mean, it, it was uh, it was really inspiring uh, uh, reading about him, and I couldn't resist to contact him to get it to the pro to, to to the podcast to talk about what happened to him. And really, I don't, I don't want to even m make questions or nothing. It just I want to I want to hear from him what happened to him and how running helped him to to continue to live basically to 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 overcome all the health problems that he had and uh, I, I don't want to even put words in his mouth I just mm. want to hear his story how it happened and how he overcome everything that happened to him I'm, I'm more I'm happy to tell you the story so um in 2016 um completely out of the blue um I wasn't very healthy, but I wasn't unhealthy either. Um, I woke up one day and my right hand side was completely paralyzed. Um, couldn't move my arm, couldn't move my leg. Um, 
And I, and the last thing anybody at my age would be thinking about would be a stroke. And I certainly, I didn't know anything about strokes, wasn't expecting it to be a stroke. But um, it turned out I'd had two at the same time. Um, and what was probably most worrying for me during that period was that nobody could actually tell me why I'd had a stroke. It, it couldn't be explained. Nobody understood why. And, and a lot of the doctors were saying, this is just something you're going to have to live with. So that, that, that kind of made me really anxious and, and quite stressed. And, and it was very difficult to sleep at night because the stroke happened whilst I was asleep. I woke up paralyzed. So I didn't know what to, to expect. I didn't know what to look out for. I didn't know what. So any twinge, anything that goes weird in your body, and we all have them all the time, any little twinge, any little funny, you know, kind of quirk or kink, Everything made me kind of go, well, is this a stroke? I don't know. It could be. So um, I was pretty highly strung during that time. Um, after that, they, uh, after a lot, of, a lot more investigations, and I kept on pushing and pushing for answers, it turned out I had a hole in my heart. Um, and that was, that was interesting. That was, uh, I had to wait a few months to, to get that sealed. And um, that's... That again, that's a bit worrying because I said to the doctor, I said, well, you know, this hole in my heart let this blood clot through. Um, how will wow. I stop? How, how do I stop this hole opening again? Like, is there anything I need to do? Do I need to stay calm? Do I need to meditate? And the doctor said, there's nothing you can do. <laughs> Everything will open it. When you eat, you will open it. When you have sex, you will open it. When you get excited, you wow. will open it. When you're not excited, you will open it. So... Um, that was kind of that was kind of an odd experience of a few months of walking on eggshells, trying not to open this hole in my heart. Mm -hmm. um, then we went into the hospital. Uh, it got sealed up, and um, I had a few months on blood thinners. And I won't go into the gory details. I'll spare you. I'll spare you the hardcore gory details in this one. But at the end of about three months after the heart operation. I started losing quite a lot of blood um, and I lost a lot of blood to the point that um, I was um, in my house and uh, I was really exhausted from losing all this blood and uh, down the toilet and I thought at one point I thought I'm just going to crawl into bed and have a little sleep and when I opened my eyes, I realized I wasn't actually in my bed at all. I'd just passed out in the bathroom. Like, I'd literally just fainted. Um, so I, had, I stood up and I came through and said to my wife, I was like, I think, I've, I think I just fainted and literally passed out again straight in front of her and dropped like a stone. Um, I'd never been in an ambulance, but that was exciting. Straight off to <laughs> um, the emergency unit. Um, and the doctors there, they... they um, you know, it's, it's quite interesting because the, the ambulance people are saying all the way, they're saying, you know, don't worry, we've got you. There's nothing to worry about. But then as soon as I got into the hospital, the emergency unit were just saying, right, you are in so much trouble. Like, <laughs> if you have an itchy nose, we need to know about it because you're the sickest person in this entire hospital and we've no beds left. Like, you are just hanging on by a thread here. So, so <laughs> it was interesting how that, that escalated quite quickly. Um, they, they filled me with, um, I think another three pints of blood and two units of, of plasma, uh, and stabilized me. But obviously there was a problem with why was I losing so much blood? And we did some exploratory colonoscopies and found that I had, a uh, cancer. I had a bowel tumor. Um, so that's required surgery they took that out through keyhole surgery um that was an that was an interesting one because um I, I think i first noticed that i was really stubborn and determined to get moving at that point because um the doctor said to me nobody leaves surgery nobody leaves hospital after anything earlier than five days you'll be with us for at least five days and it might be two weeks and almost on, on day two after surgery, I was getting up really painful. You know, it's difficult to, to up when you've had, you know, 30 centimeters of gut, you know, removed. 
but I was um, I was I was trying to do um, slow, very slow laps of the of the of the ward, and I was walking in circles around the ward, trying to get myself moving. And on day four, they came to me and said, "You can go home. You're you're fine. Like you're moving about something else. You're doing like ten laps an hour." And um, and I had to say to him, I can't. I've got no way to go home. You told me five days. My family's gone on holiday. I've got no one to take me home. I haven't even got a key. I can't get in the house. Um, so I had to stay another night. I had to book myself in for another night in the hospital, which was ridiculous. But anyway, um, they found out after that that there was still one, sadly, one tiny little bit of cancer left it got into my lymphatic system um, and that means uh, automatically um, six months of chemotherapy and um, con- contrary to what a lot of people think you know a lot of people um, do lose weight and they get very sick and and, and it's uh, and it's very you know you fade away I had the opposite I put on a lot of weight I blimped out I got big um because a couple of things was that they, they said to me, like, be, you know, before you start chemotherapy, you've got two weeks, start eating now, really bulk up because if you lose any weight, you've got some reserves there. So start eating. So I, I, I took that seriously and I start eating really loads and loads. And then um, all the way through chemotherapy, I found that I actually couldn't really cope with savory taste. So the only things I could enjoy eating that would stay stay down where were sweet so for about six months i was basic basically eating chocolate and ice cream um which you know sounds like heaven to a lot of people but you know it can wear you down after a while um i was on a permanent sugar rush uh so after after six months of that you know i've been through um two strokes a heart operation um uh you know a big bleed out um and the bowel resection and six months of chemo and at that point like i'm physically and and mentally exhausted and broken and still very stressed and i tried meditation i tried to find ways to combat anxiety i tried to sit down and try to calm myself and and you know the thing with meditation is that's that's great if you can sit still but i can't sit still um, I really can't sit and focus on one thing. So I started um, going out for long walks and that that was a good way to, to kickstart things. And then um, I'm not sure where the inspiration came from. I think a friend of mine who'd been through be- breast cancer talked about that they'd done a, a couch to 5K running. And so I, I did that. And, and their advice was just take your time really slowly it doesn't matter if you have to repeat a week. If you only get to week three and that's as far as you can go, that's fine. But just keep doing week three and that will just get you out and get you moving. And um, yeah, it was it was the hardest thing. And, and I remember thinking five kilometers is so far to run. And it almost seems like it's uh, Mount Everest. Like it seems impossible. Um but I would get out there and it was lovely getting out really early in the morning, you know, as the sun is just coming up and you start seeing the same faces in the park. You see the, you know, the little lady who takes her dogs out and you see the the young couple who who like to go for a little walk arm in arm. And, you know, you start seeing the same faces and it, and, and it, it doesn't feel embarrassing anymore and nobody's judging you and it's okay. And you, you've got your park family all of a sudden. Um, and so I took, I went up and I managed the five kilometers and then it seems, you know, it's a natural progression after that. You, you challenge yourself. Can I get up to 10 K 10 K came a few months later? Um, and again, just seemed like about as much as anyone could manage. I felt like I'd pushed it as far as you could. And then I saw I'd been involved in a, with a charity called the Stroke Foundation, and I still do a lot of voluntary work for them, which is um, talks to community groups about you know how they can avoid having a stroke, and um, they were they were looking for people to um, 
uh, run wearing their team colors in a half marathon in Melbourne called Run Melbourne. I probably had about eight or nine months to train, and that seemed like a lot. Like for somebody who'd only managed once to do 10 kilometers to suddenly step up to do a half marathon uh, seemed an awful lot. It probably was too much because I really did injure myself quite badly. Um, <laughs> uh, I've learned a lot about running since then. And I've learned, you know, that it's really important to warm up properly. And it's really important to cool down. <laughs> Part of the <properly>. basics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and but I think sometimes maybe you, only can, you can only learn this stuff by, by, you know, doing it the hard way and learning by experience. So... It, yeah, it was important to to you know kind of go through some of that, and and I learned I I my IT um band uh, was was very very fragile during the race, and I had to stop and and walk a, a few sections, um. But the thing was, I knew I could do it, and I, it took me two hours and thirteen minutes, which was uh, not completely awful for a first time and having to walk quite a lot of it no sir but it, 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 yeah but it gave me i mean what was terrifying about that was because i was raising money for a charity they put me in at the front with all the elite runners so i'm there with all these internationalists who are all competing in these big races and you know within about two seconds i was you know pushed into the barriers out the way because i was a slow coach and um, I think I, I think my number was something like I came in at number like four thousand eight hundred and seventy six. Uh, that was my position, which meant that four thousand seven hundred and eighty five people passed me. Um, I don't think I passed anybody. Every single person passed me on the way. <laughs> and, and and you can add and you can add the billion of people that stay on the couch. Yes, yes, <laughs> exactly. yes, but but. but... Yes. But the the thing is, this is just doing it. You know, that's the yeah. important thing. Just doing it and finish. <laughs> before yeah. before I, continuing, uh, Bob, I have a question because of the information that you sent us uh, yeah. on, on this on the first paragraph that you explained what happened you, to you on on 2016. It, it says, as the day progressed, I lost my ability to write and my speech was getting jumbled. Yeah. So that means that you didn't know you were passing the stroke, or it was no, it was no, progressive. I, it was it was getting worse as the day went on, and I did not know I'd had a stroke. And and one of the things was, um, and I think this is always an important point was that the only thing I knew about strokes because I'd learned this from television and from films is that people's face droops and drops on one side. Yeah. So I went and I checked myself in the mirror and I, look, I remember, you know, sort of looking at myself and kind of being sort of, uh, you know, preparing myself for this like horrible face I was going to see. And then, you know, I look my, at myself in the mirror and it's like, you know what? It's just me. I'm handsome. I'm amazing. I look fantastic. Nothing wrong with me. Um, <laughs> so, it, so as far as I was concerned, it wasn't a stroke. Um, and so I Googled um what could be, what could be wrong with me with my symptoms and it kept coming up with stroke and i was like well it's not a stroke so i kept changing it a little bit and going well you know maybe my arm's a little bit better maybe so it, it diagnosed me as being as having a um post-viral infection and i decided that's what it was well wow. it wasn't a stroke it was having a post-viral infection but then as the day went on i started finding that I couldn't, like, I tried to send my wife a text message and I couldn't spell anymore. So any word at all that I tried to write, it wasn't possible to translate the letters in my head into actual, you know, words on the, on the, on the keyboard. So um, I don't know what I sent her, complete garbage, but somehow she managed to translate it. Um, but then... Um, uh, when we got to the hospital, oh. yes. That when we got to the hospital, um, the the doctors were asking me some questions, and I, and we noticed then that I I couldn't actually get my answers out properly. So they would say to me, "How old are you?" And I would say, "I'm 24." And they they would look at me and laugh and go, "Well, you <laughs> wish you were 24." <laughs> and I would say, "Oh no, I I see what I did there. I've mixed it up. Let me do that again. I'm 24." And somehow I couldn't say numbers the right way round. 
And there was all these things that just as the day went on, it was just getting worse and worse and worse. So, um, and I didn't, I'll be honest, they put me um, in hospital that night and they wheeled me into the acute stroke unit for the night. And I still didn't believe that I'd had a stroke. And I was just thinking, well, this is the only place that they've got room for me. I was in complete denial. I was like, nope. I haven't had a stroke. This is the this is the only putting me here because um, I've got similar symptoms, and this is where they've got a spare bed. The the so. the other thing that I was surprised is that you you said on your on your email that on the hospital that you went before they they let you go, but you wanted more more information about your condition, and they they didn't give it to you, so you had to go to a, a private doctor to. He can have a better diagnosis of what happened, and yeah, so and that so strokes me. That that really strikes me. Like, if you didn't have the the taken the decision to go to a, to another doctor, maybe you're not you were not going to be with us at this moment. I I find that really scary as well. Um, I, one of the things that's very common with strokes is this this um hole in the heart and. They'd obviously done a lot of tests in the in the public hospital. They'd done um, a bubble test twice, where they inject you know a bubble stream into your blood and they um, they follow it uh, around to see if it passes through your heart or not. So mm -hmm. they'd done that twice. They they'd put a um, a camera down my throat, uh, which is I've got to say a little unpleasant. And I did ask them to turn the the gas up and, and knock me out a bit more. Um, They'd done x-rays, they'd done all sorts of things, and they, they said they, they couldn't find enough evidence that there was a hole in my heart. And what was a bit worrying was when I, I begged them and said, can we just keep pushing? And they said, well, we can send you to a private cardiologist, but it's a waste of time. There's no <laughs> point. He's just going to tell you the exact same thing as we did. And they sent me to a private cardiologist um, on the public uh, system and the the card the, the private cardiologist as soon as i met him he said you've got a hole in your heart and it's quite big and it's big enough that we need to to close it and i said well how do you know that you haven't even taken any x-rays or scans and he said i'm using the same ones the other hospital took I oh said, my but God. they said that, they said i don't have anything wrong with me he said they don't know how to read scans i do mm -hmm. this is why i have big fancy offices <laughs> I do I do this for a living. Yeah, yeah. I'm the expert and I get a lot of money for doing this and I'm telling you we need to close your heart. So um that was a little bit worrying and it does worry me that you know if you don't push when somebody says they haven't got the answers if you if you're willing to accept that then um that that means that you know you haven't got all the answers and you you know anything might happen i think it's you just got to keep pushing and pushing to get you know somebody to tell you what's going on yeah and and, and i and i know uh, about the condition you're talking about because I, my grandchild my latest yeah. one my latest one had the same issue uh on, okay. on the on the ultrasounds it, yeah. it 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 showed that he had uh, a small hole on the heart and as you yeah. said as, and as you said in your information that that a lot of people have it but uh at, at, on the time on time it closed yeah. by itself so yeah. uh, i know I, i know the stress because we were very uh, worried about that condition uh, on him yeah and uh and, and and it's very dangerous also also i wanted to comment uh to comment to you is that we we use the same application to start running i use uh from couch to 5k also okay so so it's it, a, it's um it's it's quite it's a good start um i found and i don't know if it was the same for you and i i think the first couple of weeks i was like oh this is really easy it's just you know <laughs> a lot of walking and just run a few steps and then I, i'm not sure if it was like week three or week four i suddenly found myself like really out of breath and you know kind of bent over in the street and and you know thinking like god it feels like my lungs are bleeding here like this is hard and But it it was interesting how It sort of lulled me in in a false sense of security, and then all of a sudden, um, it, it it stepped up a bit. But then at that point, you're committed. Yeah, and, and also we we had to take in consideration that you 
you you had a a, a handicap against you because you you had your con heart condition and you also have yep. the cancer treatment and you're yep. trying you're trying to start a, a, an exercise regimen that that not everybody uh, choose running to start exercising some some people go to the gym uh, some people yeah. start with with only walking so you, you decide to go one step ahead and uh and you started in, in a in a minus 10 if we can say it in, in that way a minus 10 yeah. condition that that first you had to put your body again in a, in a position that can take the exercise and then develop a a, a, a yeah. running a running form So. I didn't have, and I didn't have good shoes. I can tell you that I didn't oh. have good shoes. <laughs> you didn't started. start it with, uh, with running shoes? No, because I mean, that's the thing I think, and that's probably what a lot of people do is, you know, you take a look at, you know, decent running shoes and they're really expensive. And so yeah. I had my ordinary sneakers and I went, they'll be fine. They'll be okay. And they, and they probably were fine at that point, but, um, Uh, yeah, at, at some point you're going to have to trade in the crap old sneakers and get a decent pair of of running shoes that are going to support you. Um, I I found lots of things like I you know um, when I went to get my first pair of running shoes fitted and yeah you know I was heel striking I was rolling my feet into the uh, inside and there was all these things that you know I I needed to get support on my my feet for so. God knows how I managed to get through that 5k, but I did it. <laughs> so that's, that, that explains your IT band injury. Yep. 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 <laughs> and, you, and you were running with, with cotton shirts also? Um, I was, I was, um, running with some very, uh, ordinary sneakers for, for most of that. And then since then I've, I've kind of learned some lessons. You've got to, you've got to have the right stuff and you just, just have to bite the bullet and a good pair of shoes will last you a while anyway. Yeah. What was the, what was the, 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 the opinion of, of your family and your doctors when you started running? Um, oh, interesting. I had one doctor, um, said, you know, what you need to do is cut your beard and, and cut your hair and go to church. <laughs> really? And you said no. I want to be a, a, trail, I, I, a trail runner. <laughs> yeah, I said I don't. I don't think that's really what what's going to help me. And then I went across the road to his competitor, um, another doctor right across the street, and he said, "Oh, I wouldn't worry about what that stroke. I had a stroke just like yours. You'll be fine. Um, you probably don't want to run though. It'll be really bad for your knees." Yeah. So. There's a there's a lot of that. The, interestingly, was I actually have got um, a touch of um, arthritis, uh, osteoarthritis in one knee, and and I actually thought that that was going to be a, a really big problem for running. The thing that I've found though is that you strengthen all the muscles around the knee, mm -hmm. and actually I barely even notice that osteoarthritis anymore. In fact, I don't notice it anymore because. My legs are actually a whole lot stronger and I'm not, I'm walking better. My gait is better. Um, and all the, all the power of, of, um, the movement is actually being distributed through the muscles properly. It's not going through that knee now in the same way. So, um, yeah, I think that idea that, you know, running's bad for your knees is really rubbish. It's, it's, um, running really helps your knees, um, it spreads the load. Gets your leg, gets your legs working the way they're meant to. Yes, and and, and it's it's amazing that uh, in terms of your bones, because chemo mm -hmm. kills good bad ones and and good cell bad cells yeah. and good cells, and that, yeah. that also involve uh, our bones. So yeah. uh, you you it's a miracle that you didn't have chin splints or any other yeah. any yeah. other kind of problem. You you just only had like ligament and, and muscle aches. And, and not, yeah, nothing related I've, to bones. No, I mean I, I've had I've had very minor shin splints, um, but then you know, like I've I've learned since then, you know, you have to kind of take a step back when you've got a small injury coming. You know, foam roll the injury and and ice packs and and resting it and stuff. So I, I take injuries a bit more seriously now. Um, but no, I've never had anything like I've not had debilitating shin splints, and so. Uh, and it was only on, on one occasion. 
Um, and just just thinking about your point there about um, what you were saying about how chemo destroys, you know, the good and the bad. I mean, that was one of the the things I, I forgot to mention about why I put on weight was um, I was when I was in the hospital, they were talking to me about my diet and they said, show us, show us what you eat every day. And I was trying really hard as well to eat healthy things as much as I could, even though it wasn't going down well. And they said, just just stop trying to eat healthily. Stop mm-hmm. trying to be healthy because what you're doing is you're creating this kind of you know protective layer around um, the the tumor, and there's no there's no point doing that because we're trying to get in at it. So eat all the rubbish foods because we want we want to be able to get in at the tumor. You're you're creating this protective layer around it. So that was really hard. Was that you know you're your first instinct when you're not well is to try and eat healthily, but actually the advice was you got to eat rubbish. And and that's, so, <laughs> that's interesting because uh, at least doctors on, on the United, United States and on, on this side of the world, they're going to say you need to eat healthy. Yeah. It's not so, going to help. <laughs> so those, those doctors are, uh, are the good ones. But, yeah, but, it was, but, I mean, so, yeah. But not the one that wants you to be a priest. No, 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 <laughs> no, that was an, I didn't stay very much longer with him. And, and what about your wife? What about what, your wife and, and your children? What, what they t- told you about it? Um, so I think my, both my kids were, they were quite young and um, we tried to kind of spare them too many details. But the thing with after a stroke is, um, and it's very high. It's very hard to hide the the effects of a stroke. Partly because, like you know, your brain is where you live. It's where your whole um, person. It's not not just where your personality is, but it's where you know the computer that controls your your bodily functions. It controls your breathing. It controls uh, your heart rate. It controls your movement. Controls everything. And it's the way that I describe it, it's like somebody has broken into your house and kicked over all the furniture. So everything's everything's still there, but it's all a bit upside down. And, you know, for a while you're going to have to, you know, you know, somebody's going to have to come in and put the legs back on the couch and someone's going to have to, you know, s- square up those paintings on the walls again. Everything's a bit out of shape. So sometimes with a stroke, um, people have really odd reactions to things. Sometimes people will uh, laugh all the time and and it seems really inappropriate because you might be thinking, I'd like to help this person. I'd like to show some empathy or compassion or sympathy towards them. And and they're just laughing at you and you think, oh, they're not, that's, that's not right. But they haven't got another way of expressing themselves. Some people might get angry and they know in themselves they're not meaning to come across angry, but they can't help it. What happened with me was I was just crying all the time. So anytime anybody asked me a question for about three weeks, I just burst into tears. Hey, hey Bob, what about depression? Do you get uh, into a depression moment or, or it was... Um, I think it was probably didn't actually even have enough time to get depressed because I was so exhausted with... Um, inability to sleep because because the stroke oh. had happened whilst I was asleep um yeah. are you were afraid to, to fall asleep yeah so so that was really hard so anytime I was just about to drop off it would be like having a panic attack going oh, oh no don't God. don't don't so I was probably surviving on you know absolute minimum sleep for months on the end and um yeah that's really that I mean that, that's obviously going to affect your mood and keep you Oh pretty, God, pretty is, low, is... pretty depressed. So, you know, the kids were dealing with dad who's looking, you know, exhausted. And, you know, every time they ask me a question, I'm bursting out into tears. So we go to the supermarket and, hey, dad, shall we buy bananas this week? And I just burst into tears. Oh, you know, and that, yeah. must be, yeah. They must be looking yeah, but... at me going, what, what is wrong with weird, embarrassing dad? <laughs> um, I, I, I... I did have a question for you. How, yeah. how afraid you were after oh. all this happened? Um, I think the the not knowing what a stroke felt like or not knowing exactly um, 
what the symptoms to look out for were, like what what would be what would how would it feel in my own body? Not knowing that was terrifying. So oh, almost God. anything, almost anything felt like it was a stroke. And it felt for several months that I was kind of just living on in, in a perpetual circle of, of, you know, anything could be a stroke and I could be dying at any second. Um, and that's, you know, you, you would be thinking possibly maybe you should be making your peace with the world or whatever, but it's just actually, it's really difficult to get through day to day when you're constantly thinking like this, this might be the end. Like it's really exhausting yeah i see i see but but let, um, let's go to the positive things uh you yeah start, you started running you found you finished your first 10k you finished your half marathon and yeah. now uh then you get uh involved in, in other uh charities uh regarding your condition talk talk to me about your 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 next races and and how how you improve and how running uh, help you with all these uh, situations around you and your family. So, um, so interestingly, at the at this point, I was about I was forty five. I was just coming up for forty five, and my dad had had done one marathon in his life, and he'd done it at the age of forty five. And I went right. I have to get I have to get a marathon in before I'm forty six. Oh. Not not that I'm very competitive, but I can't <laughs> let him beat me on that. <laughs> um and you know like he he had a I, he did an amazing time he did his in about three hours 28 i was never going to contemplate that but i wanted to to me a marathon was like the absolute ultimate challenge for a human being and to try and take that on after the, the previous few years um it, it's it felt like it was you know a something to to try possibly a step beyond me but i wanted to try it um so i started training for a marathon mm -hmm. i had a coach in my local town uh, a wonderful woman called rachel who was doing fitness classes and um she was kind of coaching me setting me some some routines some strength work to do um started following um a, a kind of course uh to start building up some more endurance but, but um, you were you were running by yourself, not nine yeah, yeah. or so nothing. Just by myself. I yeah, I would do yourself. once a month. I would do a park run. So we've got a local, uh, you know, five kilometers here, um, mm -hmm. and it's you know, like like all park runs, we all say you know, hey, it's not competitive. It's just you know, you're just running for your own PB. You're, we're not trying to to beat anybody. So of course, it's super competitive. Sure, it's super competitive. Um, everybody's everybody's aggressively trying to yeah. You know, to deal. Um, but no, but it is also and it's really good fun because it's it's a lot of neighbors just coming down to the park on a you know a Saturday morning and and you know half of it's all gossip and and, and chit chat and, and neighbor neighborliness. So. Um, so that was, I was meeting a lot of other people around it, um, but I, I was, but running's kind of a solo sport. It's a lonely game, you know, get out it, there. Yeah, for a marathon, it's uh, super yeah. lonely. <laughs> yeah, you know, you got to go out there for a, for a long time by yourself. Um, yeah. But everyone was being really supportive about the idea of, of trying to run the marathon. So I was training away and I'd entered a, um, a race down here called the Great Ocean Road Marathon, which... Um, the Great Ocean Road is a really famous, long road, uh, hundreds of miles long along the Victorian coastline, um, built by um, uh, returned servicemen after the Second World War, and they, they kind of wanted oh. to kind of, yeah, contribute um, something and um, put, you know, uh, so, they, so they built this amazing road, and, it you know, it goes up and down the hills and falls the coastline. You get some fantastic views. Um, and it's and it you know tourists flock to it. So there's a 44 kilometer stretch between the town of um, Lorne and Apollo Bay that gets closed off for the day, and it's just wonderful because it's ve it's you know the road's very narrow at points, and so you wouldn't be able to run it when it was normally open because of the cars because there's the you cars, know they're yeah. flying rounds and blind corners. So the close. So the idea of running this on, uh, you know, when it's been closed off is 
is a wonderful opportunity. So I was training to run that, but then COVID happened. And, oh, yeah. and of course, you know, marathons everywhere were getting cancelled. And But um, Australia was real strong in in close everything in, in, in during the yeah, pandemic. Right. I, got, I mean that was the thing was we we'd um we'd managed to stop it getting into the, the, the country for a long time, but then um uh, it was really the problem was nobody was vaccinated and and so oh. and we didn't have any vaccines. Um we'd been really slow to acquire them here. So the the race was we have to keep suppressing it as much as possible until we get the vaccination numbers up. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, like I think most of us were on board with that. That was un understood that, you know, that just meant we had to modify our lives for a while, but it meant that things like in-person marathons were just not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And when you've been training and training for a marathon, for it to be cancelled, you know, when you're not that far out, that's, that's quite, you know, that's that's difficult because you're already, you've built yourself up and you don't want to, you know, have done all that training for nothing. Yeah. So I, I spoke to the cancer hospital that had looked after me and I said, look, I, I want to do something. I've measured by car the route from um, the hospital going down some back roads over the, the hills and through a few old towns if you go back from the hospital to my house, it's 44 kilometers. It's the same okay. distance as the marathon. Oh um, my God. Yeah. So you decided yeah. to go there. <laughs> right. so, said, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do it from, from the hospital to my house. Um, and I'll, I'll raise some money for the, for the hospital. And they oh, love that idea. So they, wow. we started raising money for um, chair based um, exercise equipment. So, Whenever somebody's in the chemotherapy unit from the, from then on, um, mm -hmm. they would be able to, you know, put their feet in a little um, cycling machine or use some um, strengthening bands or something wow. like that. So, um, so they were really keen to get involved. Um, they set me up with a few sort of interviews for you know local newspapers and um, and TV to kind of uh, spread the word. Um, and That's great. Yeah, yeah. The the thing that was that was a bit scary was on the actual weekend of the marathon, um, we got we got a weather warning and oh. um, we were we were everybody was being advised to stay indoors and not to go out and, and that's not it's not what well, you want. You, to you do. in Australia, you where you have typhoons or typhoons, right? Or uh, we have um, we have. Uh, well, up north where it's a bit more tropical, you might get um, uh, hurricanes um, coming across. Okay. Um, oh. But we, um, but down south, we're, we we tend not to. But we were we we don't really get such exotic weather down in Victoria. It's a bit more ordinary. But um, we we had what they were describing was called an Arctic blob. So this. Um, freezing weather had descended <laughs> over um and there was all these weather warnings and i'd i'd gone out for my my final run the day before i uh, and it was just a three kilometers and i had such a headache from these like freezing winds penetrating worse, straight yeah. at me and i thought i'm never going to manage this and a friend <laughs> phoned me um that night and he said i really don't want you to go out i think you're gonna die like i think hey, you're Bob, gonna die like this hey, Bob, is really do you do you have a uh, like a team for doing that or you were doing it by yourself no so so i was so actually i'll, I'll come to that bit but so went on the day of it and i i took off and i started running very early morning from oh. outside the hospital and i actually didn't know that this was going to happen but at the halfway point the park runners from my town they started taking it in turns to pace me and that was a wonderful thing yes. because um i think i'd have i think i would have come in a lot slower but at the halfway point um my friend kate was waiting for me uh with a great big grin everybody because you know they're not going to have to run so far they're all padded up in gloves and woolly hats and uh big jackets but 
she she came with me for you know about four kilometers and I remember her saying you know like am I going too fast for you and I went I thought well no you're going faster than I would want to go but this is good we're going fast this is good and then her husband took on uh, and he took on the next bit and then another guy from another village came in and oh, what was God. lovely was that you know um because people knew that I was doing this, I'd started running by myself really, you know, pre-dawn. And when I was getting closer and closer to my town, crowds were coming out to um, uh, to come and give me a clap as I went through. And people were running up to me to, to hand some money into the, the fundraiser. Oh, trade. really? Oh, God. <laughs> Which is lovely. But fortunately, you know, because I had these other runners with me, they were like, I'll I'll, I'll stop and take take the money. You keep running. You keep running. Because oh, it's probably great. not the best thing to start stuffing notes into your shorts whilst you're running. No, no, no. <laughs> not the moment for that. <laughs> no, no, not, not great. Not great. But that was good because... Um, I had um, I had this little crowd with me eventually as we're we're coming to the the end and I think round about forty kilometers I absolutely absolutely hit the wall and um, the, everybody else was chatting and and quite you know you know because they've only run you know maybe ten k at this point so they're all chatting away and. Um, I uh, I just said to everybody, I've got to just put my head down now. I'm I'm not going to be talking. I'm not I'm not I'm just focusing now. Yeah, well, Sorry, <laughs> if you talk to me, I'm not going to hear you. But it's head down, and I'm just going to absolutely have to power my way through this one. Um, and yes, the last four kilometers were horrendously grueling. But you know, if you've just if you've gone forty k forty kilometers already, then you just got to get through it. You just got to find a way. Oh, definitely. That's, oh, that's a that's a wonderful story. So, how much you you finally you uh, you know you get from from fundings and people yeah. helping you out? Uh, I think we raised um, seven and a half thousand Australian dollars. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know how that translates, but yeah, that's it was a fair whack of money. So um, that's pretty good. Yeah, it's good. It's really good. Are yeah. you are you planning to continue to do it every year, or what is it, your plan with that? So um, I've been, I've now done. I've just finished uh, two weeks ago my third marathon. So I've been doing one a year since. So the oh, following yeah. year after that, I did finally get to do the Great Ocean Road. Oh, um, right. which was which was beautiful because I've got to say I, I have to tell you, um, the, we had a little bit of rain, but it meant we had rainbows coming over the hills, over oh. the track that we were running on, and you know the rainbows descending into the ocean. You couldn't make it up. It was the most beautiful experience ever. Um, but there was a lot of hill climbing, and uh, that was that's. Um, I highly recommend it as a marathon, but it's also be warned. It's hillier than you think. It's a little bit, that, that's, little bit brutal. That's good to know because uh, uh, Jose is is a fan of uh, marathons around the world. Not not exactly yeah. the, the six world marathon. We have we have wow. run three of them, but he he usually likes to go uh, as a tourist and as an athlete. Uh, to other yeah. countries to participate to specific, I think it's a great idea. Specific marathons, you know, and and and, yeah. and we never we never heard about marathons in Australia before, you know. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's excellent that you are taking yeah. the time to give us that information because I know Jose is uh, wondering. <laughs> He's already looking up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it's, I, I how, guess it's, how better to know people that yeah. running. <laughs> I know he's he is he is. Thinking about, hmm, that's a great opportunity to meet Bob. <laughs> hey, Bob. Yeah, yeah. How, how better to know people after 30 kilometers running? Absolutely. That you start struggling and you look to your side and say, man, I'm struggling too. Help me out to finish this. And yes, you become absolutely. friends. They're right there and running. I mean, that's, yes. that's the best way to do it. <laughs> I, I, I call it, I talk about my marathon family. And yeah. you've got because after after maybe that first sort of 10 kilometers everybody settles into their place and the people exactly. are around you they're they're doing the same pace as you you're probably going to be doing most of the the run with them you might mm -hmm. pass each other back and forth a little bit 
but you're you're in a pack now, and and these are your people, and so I remember you know talking to my family about this, kind of going at the end of a race, you really want to find your your marathon family again. You want to find them all and give them a hug and go and talk to them all. So I've started doing that now. I've started oh, yeah. finding those people. Um, and after the one I just finished there, it was great where um, after I finished the, uh, past the, the finishing line, two men and then uh, another group of girls came up to me and they said, oh, we've, we've been following you for 21 kilometers. <laughs> and I said, really? I could hear them. I knew there was, you know, some people behind me, but I was waiting for you to pass. And he said, no, we never, we never managed to pass you, but we were just sitting on your tail for 21 kilometers and we just let you pace us. And I was like, okay. So I felt really lonely because I was on my own, but you guys had me all the time. <laughs> um, but that was kind of funny because that was a guy from Scotland. So um, two Scottish guys running almost side by side in, in Australia. That's, that's great. A, that's that's excellent. That's, a, that's cool. Uh, Manzano is a, a, a little different. He started scanning people who I can pass, who mm. I can pass, who I can win this race. And it yeah. never happened. <laughs> <laughs> I just see their I just see their backs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But, Bob, I, I I'm reading that you are planning uh, to run a 50k before your 50th birthday. I think that's the, I think this is the thing when you start running. Um, marathons it becomes this i mean i i don't think uh i don't think you can say i've run a marathon and therefore i've ticked off that challenge like that's it marathons are easy they're not easy they're every single one of them is hard yes, um, yeah they're all they're all one step beyond what i think is is you know physically possible for a normal person at any time they're they're all a challenge um so i hadn't really thought about ultras but but you know, I'm not far off fifty. Um, I've got on my arm. I've got um, tattooed. I've got uh, some um, uh, fennel flowers, and fennel gave its name to the town of Marathon. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got one flower for my stroke, one flower for the heart operation, one flower for cancer, one flower for my first half marathon. One for my first full marathon. I want to get one for an ultra marathon. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> I want to get one for an ultra, and then then I've got my journey from start to finish in, in fennel flowers. Wow. Um, and I think uh, a fifty k. I mean, that's the thing is, you know yourself. I'm sure you guys obviously know this one is. Um, you know, when you get to marathon. There's a point where, you know, you get to maybe 36 kilometers or whatever, 20 odd miles, 22 miles or something. And you just, you know, you're kind of taking it as far as your body can, but you, you can dig deep on the day. You yes. can dig hard. You can, yes. you know, find some inner strength and you can just push yourself to get over that line. And you can actually find yourself sprinting over the end as well. Mm -hmm. And, I guess the thing I'm looking at a 50 is going, well, you just, we just got to step up where, where we find that, you know, it's just, it's that, it's just another six. It's a kilometers. challenge. It's a challenge. Yeah. It's a, another six it's a challenge. Kilometers. Yeah. Oh yeah. And, uh, so. uh, the thing is, is, I don't know. It's a, like you say, every marathon is a story. It's a, yeah. it's a, it's hard to do it. I mean, uh, but, what a great feeling finishing oh yeah wow it's nothing yeah. like every time that you finish something like that you just hey i did it and yeah that is and, a wonderful and, feeling and i know just now because i i feel like i've done this now enough times to recognize that i'm because i'm, a, I'm two weeks after a marathon i'm i'm sitting enjoying that feeling and it mm -hmm. feels good and i'm i'm i can uh you know um celebrate you know, a, a very lengthy training program and the, the highs and lows of that, but it's all paid off and it all came out well. I got my first ever sub four hours. So I came in at 3.55. So wow. um, wasn't wow. wasn't expecting that. Um, wow. And even didn't train for it, but, you know, pushed hard for it. Um, but I know, I know that in a few months time, I'm going to get, you know, I'm going to get itchy because I'm going to start thinking, but that's not my last marathon. Hey, hey, Bob, not. 
I want to do this again. One more. One more. I, I really love when I really love when people say I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> because yeah, yeah. You, you trained. You trained for that, sir. Well, that's the thing. I didn't actually train. I didn't train for a uh, sub four though. Um, and I do know that when I was uh, I started that race, I was coming out way, way, way too hot. Like um, I was just absolutely out the blocks. But then you know the it's it's one day in your life, and I I tried to to see whether or not I could moderate that pace and bring it down a bit. But you know you're just caught up in the day, and I'm just enjoying myself. And I had a huge grin in my face, and I went. Why the hell am I trying to slow down? <laughs> this is great. We're we're flying here. Just go with it. And I, for the first time, you know, I had seven minutes. Um, so wow. what was it? The first the first half marathon, I had seven minutes to spare before getting to two hours. And I thought, you know what? I've got. If I can keep some, I'll lose a bit of time in the second half. But if we keep pushing hard, I, I'll I can do it. So yeah, I lost another couple of minutes, but. Um, and that that marathon was all uphill. Oh, the whole thing was uphill. Not not oh. very steep. Not very steep. I've got to say, but it was on an old rail trail, so an abandoned railway line. So the whole thing is on a, a an incline from start to finish. So, oh god, you know, so, that's it, something it else. To, then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So it starts to grind in those legs. I mean, it's a very gentle incline, but at, you know, nearly nearly forty kilometers. That's really starting to make those hip flexors start to scream i start feeling heavy <laughs> yeah hey, very heavy yeah hey, hey, Bob, I, got, I got a question yeah when when you knew you know between all your health struggles yeah and running that you really got over the hump and say oh i got this i, I feel like uh, i can i'm dominating everything so oh. I don't know that I'm not I'm not sure if I ever really ever felt that. Um gosh, I wonder. I think sometimes I think there's there wasn't af it wasn't after a particular race, but I know that there has been some mornings when and not every time, not every training run is fun. Not some of them are hard and some of them are miserable. But sometimes mm -hmm. you go out and you just like I always try and make a point of chasing the sunrise if I can get out and, and if I can run into the sunrise first thing in the morning, like it's glorious. Your day is always going to feel good. And I think there was a point one day when I was just, you know, climbed to the top of the hill near my town and was just kind of just running into this glorious sunrise and just went, but this is good. This is a good place where we are. Like you are enjoying yourself. How did this happen that you are absolutely loving this moment where you are? You're out of breath. You've just run up a hill, but isn't it the best thing in the world? Yeah, and, and I, I can I can even imagine what uh, what is that feeling? Because you know, after struggling with so much, hmm. wh what you had to tell people that are in that struggle right now? Um, I think uh, I think just don't don't give up keep pushing keep pushing hard and that just might be not necessarily running that's just getting through day to day that's just seeing that there is you know there is better days to come and and just keeping you know just keep pushing yourself as as hard as you can um i don't think it i don't think there's more to it than that i think it really is just that simple don't give up Exactly. I think as soon as we, I think as soon as we give up on ourselves, that's when um, I used I used to work in um, aged care homes, and and one of the things we always kind of found there was, you know, quite often the nurses and the doctors they're doing everything for the residents, and at mm -hmm. that point people start they start giving up looking after themselves or pushing themselves because there's somebody to to feed you and someone to clothe you. But the more that you can remain independent, the more that you're you're doing stuff for you, for yourself, um, I think that's that's really important. So uh yeah, it's hard to explain, but I think it's just it's just not giving up. Yeah. Determination. Uh, uh, it, it, Bob, and 
where people can send you questions or just ask you something or send you an email or send you a question where, where they can find you uh, um, in the in the in the social media ah uh, yeah they can find me on uh, under bob cg um c e g e e or um i've also got a blog called cycling into the bin so oh, if you have a look for www.cyclingintothebin.com um I recorded all my um, uh, chemotherapy sessions. Not an awful lot about chemotherapy, but it's a lot of kind of just meandering thoughts and stories. But you can get in touch with me there. And, you know, anyone who's going through cancer or going through stroke or or just doesn't know how to, you know, um, pick themselves up and, and maybe start turning, you know, some of those challenges into into better health. You know, I'm I'm always happy to have a chat with anyone. That's great. Thank you, Bob. But it really, uh, listen to you is a, is a testimony that never give up. Never. Yep. It's, it's, it's that. It's just simple. Yep. Just yep. Uh, have the, the, the courage to continue to live, to, to have that uh, feeling of, of life. You yes. know, it's just, uh, and thank you for, for sharing your story. It's just, uh, I want to, if we touch one person, yes, it's wonderful. That's what we're looking for. And, and I'm still thinking oh, about, point. and I'm still thinking about your tattoos because you can do a shirt about it and and, and raise yeah, funds. Yeah. I, yes, I, I guess you can use the same tattoos and put it on a shirt and and and, and raise funds for your hospital or, or other other things related to the causes that you like. So take that in consideration. Oh, I, I was going to give you. I was going to give anyone who's thinking about raising money as well here's a good tip i asked everybody who was um donating to my fund for the hospital they could nominate a, a song for my playlist and so that was that got lots of people involved so people want to nominate because they've got a song they want to give you and that really helps as a runner as well because when all these songs come in you start remembering who it was who nominated that song so yeah. I keep using the same soundtrack every time. Hey, Bob, uh, later on, please send us the, the places that they can find you so Ramon yep. can put it in the, in the, our uh, page and so the people welcome. can... And the picture you know, of the tattoos. <laughs> the the <Yeah>. pictures. <laughs> yeah. So, no, remember, it, any, anything can inspire somebody. Yeah. And that's what we're looking for, to, to give that hope to people. Yeah. To continue to fight and uh, continue to be uh, and Bob uh, Bob already have a trail runner look so uh. <laughs> I've got that I've got that beard so yeah that's a mountain man yeah you got it you got it going on <laughs> yeah 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 so how many marathons did you say you've done uh, I have uh, nine but uh, well wow. I have I have eight officially and one ultra and and Jose yeah. al always tell me that I have dead nine. I, I, I no, no, yeah, we, yeah. we we going for 20. He doesn't yeah, know, yeah. but uh, we are going for 20. <laughs> <laughs> At least five ultras in between the 20s. Yeah, so sure. he still got some that. I think that, see, I love hearing things like that because um, after, when, after I'd had my stroke and I was kind of like, oh, how am I going to, you know, how long have I got left? And then I met somebody in a stroke survivors group and they were talking about how it had been 10 years since their stroke. And I was like, oh, you mean there's actually a future? And it's like the same when you guys are talking about, oh, I've done 10 marathons. It's like, oh, yeah, so it's it can be done. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, and as a matter of fact, I start running at 46. So, oh, there you go. Yeah, so that must be the age where we all I, having a midlife crisis. Yeah, that definitely. <laughs> oh, most definitely. Most definitely. He lost the hair after that. I, I, yeah. I, I, I changed a new car for run, for new shoes for running. So yeah, yeah. that that's my yeah. midlife crisis, and, and after that, I, I I met a Jose, and we we have run uh, several marathons together, and and traveled to several countries together, and we still and, have to go more, and, and still love the run. We oh, love yeah. running so much that then we started the podcast. So that's uh, oh, brilliant! Well what, done. What, what 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 more? That's the best thing ever. And, is, and look, and I've got to say, look, it's great because uh, I think everybody who does run. They want to talk about running, 
and they love to talk about running, but there's no one to talk to running about. So it's great to talk to you guys about it. <laughs> and, yeah, and, right. and you know, the, 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 the thing about our podcast, uh, you, we know that we have uh, elite uh, athletes running uh, marathons and, and they train very hard yeah. to, to do that and, and go to those, those times yeah. on the marathons. But what we specialize on the good uh, stories of, of the regular runner. The, the ones that, uh, yeah, that yeah. train for, for a promise because he got health about yeah. something that happened to him or he wants to improve yeah. the, the, his health or he's running because a, fa a family member had something and he wanted to uh, share his story. Those are the stories that we specialize and we live for because uh, if, we, yeah. if we take a, a, a race or a marathon, And, and we talk about only the elites, we are talking about maybe a hundred athletes, but we, we talk about the regular yeah. runner, we are talking about the other 25,000 yes. that are running, uh, yeah, yeah. on that, on that time. And that's, that's what we want to do. That's why we love talking to people like you. And that's what we want to continue to do. And, and I, I, we want to express that, um, you have two friends in, on this side of the world. And, and, and keep, keep us informed about all your new races and things that are happening. And, uh, and we want to thank you for your time. Uh, we are almost running out of time. So you're going to hear a music that is uh, um, typical music from Puerto Rico. So don't get too excited. So <laughs> <laughs> we want to share the people that is listening to this podcast where You can hear about us. We are in every podcast platform. Uh, the one that you like, we are there. Just go to the search bar and write Corriendo Sobre 50. That's, that, that's in Spanish. But uh, if, you, if, if you can uh, write it down on the, on the search bar, you can find us. There's going to be a, a pair of shoes and a medal and a beer bottle in the middle. That's us. Uh, you can follow us in all uh, social platforms like fe Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. In, in Twitter, we are podcast C as in Charles, S as in Sam, 50. And in Facebook, we are Corriendo Sobre 50 Podcast. And in Instagram, we are Corriendo Sobre 50 Podcast also. So uh, I was telling Bob before starting the podcast that English is not our native language. So... If we made oh, any mistake, we, we do it. We do it. If we Come make on. any mistake, please forgive us. We're trying to do our best. This is our second episode in English, and we we want to have more. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you, Bob, for your story. Thank you, Bob. Thank you for everything. And uh, Mr. Otero, see you hey, soon. Hey, hey, mastica in English. <laughs> <laughs> see you soon, people. Thank you. See you. Gracias.